welcome to another episode of Untold Legends, where we explore the stories found within the world of video games, movies, comic books, and anything in between. In Chapter 5 of the Perfect Castlevania Timeline, the legacy of Simon Belmont lived on through his grandson, when Dracula's remains were used to create a phantom impersonating the Dark Lord. When the true Dracula was revived, Youth Stone grandson Richter Belmont took his place among the legendary Belmont clan and rescued the captured girls from his village, destroying the vampire. But his victory was short-lived when the Dark Priest Shaft cast his own dark power over him and Alucard was forced to re-enter the conflict. Alucard freed Richter from Shaft's control and slew his father with his own hands, saving the world from Dracula's wrath. Before we get started, let's discuss some main ideas to expect from this chapter. This chapter offers an explanation as to why the Belmonts could no longer use the Vampire Killer. In canon, the actual reason they couldn't touch the whip has never been explained in detail and remains in mystery. And this era of Castlevania contains games that have been repeatedly taken in and out of official canon. For them to flow well and work flawlessly, we'll have to make some assumptions and take some creative liberties. And the completely canon order of Ecclesia has never been given an official date. All we know is that Konami says it takes place sometime shortly after Symphony of the Night. And finally, I'm aware of the sequel to Symphony of the Night, the radio drama. It's a fairly awful story, it doesn't exist in video game form, and conflicts with many established details, like the character Ludmil, who was a servant to Alucard in Dracula's castle, and tried saving Lisa, yet he's never been mentioned in any other source, so it'll be mostly ignored. After the events of Symphony of the Night, Alucard sought to hide himself from the world. Richter returned home to Annette and realized something horrific. Dracula and Shaft's ultimate plan had been successful, a Belmont raising the castle and becoming its new Dark Lord caused a strong reaction from the whip. The vampire killer rejected direct Belmont blood and caused him pain by simply touching it. In Belmont hands, the whip had essentially become useless. Maria followed Alucard and refused to leave his side. She urged him to see the world and live his life instead of shutting himself away. She reminded Alucard of his mother and her attempts to soothe Dracula's pain. The pair became fond of each other, but Alucard resisted giving in to his feelings for Maria. He refused to risk passing on his bloodline, but his time with Maria convinced him more than ever that the human race was worth protecting. Richter eventually tracked down Alucard and Maria and informed them what happened with the whip. Alucard knew this was a sign that he needed to take an active role in humanity's protection from here on out, and Richter placed the vampire killer in Alucard's care in order to find a solution beyond Richter's own lifetime, and Alucard left to search for answers. With a heavy heart, he had to leave Maria behind for the greater good of humanity. Although Richter no longer possessed the vampire killer, he was still a deadly hunter, and spent his days traveling and fighting the creatures of the night with Maria at his side. Alucard currently had no idea how to restore the connection between the Belmonts and the Whip, but he did know that Dracula would return someday and others would need to be prepared to fight in the Belmont's absence. During his confrontation with his father, Dracula expressed remorse over his actions when he learned of Lisa's final words. But his hatred of humanity was far too great, and remorse would not end his mission to avenge his wife's murder. Dracula had made it his duty to exterminate mankind. As Alucard traveled the land, he learned of an organization called Ecclesia that had been secretly studying glyph magic for decades to combat evil. Alucard befriended the leader of the order, a man named Barlow, and developed trust that he could help in the battle against Dracula, until the Belmonts could be restored to their rightful place. Alucard still held Dracula's remains, and Barlow was confident that he could unmake the indestructible relics, if he had the opportunity to study them. Alucard left Dracula's remains in Barlow's custody, and using his knowledge from the Belmont Estate Library, he helped Barlow construct a magical seal that can hold back Dracula's resurrection temporarily, and Alucard set off on his journey, leaving the relics with Barlow, a mistake that would have dire consequences. Barlow began studying the remains and believed they could be used used against Dracula in the future if he could simply extract and harness their inner power. He was able to successfully destroy them and created three magical glyphs he believed could be used against Dracula in the future. Three glyphs that together he referred to as the power of Dominus, created from Dracula's remains and powered by Dracula's anger, his agony, and his hatred. But being in the presence of such dark power for so long had left him vulnerable to Dracula's influence, and the Dark Lord slowly wormed his way into Barlow's head, and he began searching for someone powerful enough to wield Dominus. In the early 1800s, Barlow found two orphan children and brought them into Ecclesia, a boy named Albus and a girl named Shinoa. The children were raised within Ecclesia and grew up together, learning the magical powers the Order studied. Albus became protective of Shinoa and took on the role of her older brother. Both of them grew into powerful young adults, but there was something special about Shinoa. She could absorb and use glyphs like no other, and she could control dark magic without losing herself in the process. 
by the year 1815, Barlow had completely fallen under Dracula's influence and was seeking to use Dominus to restore him. The rest of the Order was completely unaware of his true plans, and he kept the origin of Dominus secret. Using all three Dominus glyphs at the same time could break the seal holding Dracula back, but they also demanded a sacrifice. So Barlow groomed Shinoa to be that sacrifice without her knowledge. At some point, Albus learned that Dominus would kill its user, and he begged Barlow to let him sacrifice himself instead of Shinoa. Barlow agreed and sent Albus on a mission, but it was a ruse to get him away from Shinoa and allow Dominus to be bestowed upon her. Albus learned that Barlow had lied to him just before Shinoa left to accept her destiny, and he was outraged, leading us to the year 1815 and the events of Castlevania Order of Ecclesia. Shinoa met with Barlow and began the ritual of accepting Dominus into her body in front of an altar dedicated to resurrecting Dracula, a secret not known to her or Albus, and he interrupted the ritual to save her life. Albus threatened Barlow with his magical gun, the Agartha, and stole Dominus for himself. He didn't know how to absorb and use its power, but he would do anything to protect Shinoa, and he escaped Ecclesia. Since the ritual was interrupted, Shinoa suffered severe memory loss. She had to begin her training from the beginning and learn to absorb basic glyphs used for attacking. She also couldn't remember her early years growing up alongside Albus and the emotional connection they used to share, and Barlow used this to his advantage. He gave the young girl the mission of going after Albus and recovering Dominus at all costs. He was marked as a traitor to the Order, and Barlow told her that he was the one responsible for her memory loss. Shinoa began her journey in a nearby monastery and easily followed the trail he left behind. The dark power of Dominus was having an effect in the region, and Dracula's monsters were rising, and Shinoa was forced to face the Arthroverta. After defeating the creature, she found Albus, a man she no longer remembered, and she blamed him for losing her memories. She was solely focused on her mission, to retrieve Dominus from Albus and bring him in alive. But this wasn't the Shinoa that he remembered. She was much weaker and still relearning how to wield the magical glyphs as weapons. Before leaving, Albus taunted Shinoa and left her a clue to his next whereabouts. He was purposely leaving a trail behind for her to follow. The map Albus left behind led Shinoa to a quiet, empty village, Weigel Village, where she found a man trapped inside a crystal sealed with a glyph. Shinoa absorbed the glyph and freed him. <laughs> old man Nikolai had fallen victim to an attack from Albus. He trapped him and took 12 other villagers there hostage. Not only did Shinoa have to find Albus, retrieve Dominus, and bring him back alive, now she had to rescue the villagers that he had taken. She crossed through the nearby forest and the Kaleidos Channel, a body of water with unpredictable weather patterns. The conditions present capsized traveling ships regularly, and it now contained the added dangers posed by Dracula's mermen. And Shinoa discovered one of the villagers, Jacob, the owner of Weigel Village's general store. Albus had left the villagers in random areas along his trail for her to find, completely safe, inside their crystal enclosures, and Shinoa asked herself what Albus's possible end plan could be. After crossing the channel, Shinoa found herself on Monera Prison Island, an abandoned structure that used to house criminals forgotten by society. A prison island filled with empty cells where rumors of a functioning lighthouse and haunted passageways persisted. Rumors that were indeed true.
Deep within the prison, she ran into Albus again, but this time he did something unusual. He willingly handed over a piece of Dominus, Dracula's Hatred. Albus could feel the level of power coming from the glyph, and that confirmed his suspicions. It was indeed derived from Dracula. Shinoa urged him to come back to Ecclesia, but Albus knew his place was no longer the errand boy of Barlow. He was secretly watching Shinoa and hoped to learn how to use Dominus by observing her growing power, and another villager was found. Abram, an ex-thief that became Weigel Village's medicine maker. More villagers were hidden beyond the island's lighthouse, but the way was protected by the Brachiora, a giant crab from the deepest depth of the sea. Eugene awaited, Weigel Village's local blacksmith, and Aeon, the town's chef, was also rescued. And along the way, Shinoa also found Monica the seamstress. The villagers awaited the rescue of the others and helped Shinoa in her quest however they could, and she continued her search in the nearby Timio Mountains, finding the village jeweler, Laura, and Marcel, a journalist that was kidnapped while investigating paranormal creatures appearing in the area. The mountain trails led her to one of the areas in the region where the forces of evil were most active. Temple dedicated to the dead and built from the bones of the fallen, the Skeleton Cave. The remains of the dead were once again alive and searching for the living, but the most dangerous creature inside the Skeleton Cave was the Man-Eater, a vicious insect that made its home inside several fused skulls. Albus expected that Shinoa was capable of defeating the Man-Eater and had just finished crystallizing another villager. She questioned why he was involving the villagers, and Albus promised it would all make sense soon. The villager George revealed that Albus had been drawing some blood from them, confusing Shinoa further. Was there something special about the blood inside the villagers that he needed? On the way back to the village, Shinoa freed a little boy called Serge that lived there. His mother and sister were still missing, but if they were anything like the others, Albus likely had them safe and crystallized somewhere. But before finding the rest of them, multiple monsters stood in her way, one of the most powerful being the Ruzalka, a demon from Slavic legends gifted with the ability to control water. <laughs> Shinoa followed Albus's trail to Daniela, an elderly woman that claimed to be a vampire hunter in her youth, but now she focused her talents on baking cakes. Albus was waiting for her again, but placed another test for Shinoa to surpass with her growing abilities, the Goliath. After defeating the Goliath, he awarded Shinoa with another gift, the second part of Dominus, Dracula's Anger. <laughs> An 
any questions if she knew what it really was. Shanoa only knew what Barlow had told her, that the glyph was the ultimate weapon to destroy Dracula. Albus revealed that she was half right. That's what Dominus was originally created for, but it was made directly from Dracula's remains. Dominus was nothing more than Dracula's power purified in a usable form, and he urged Shanoa to ask Barlow herself. On the way back, she encountered the Gravedricus, a gigantic fish-type monster that could swim underground, and tracked its prey by sensing vibrations in the earth. By this time, Albus believed he had learned enough from watching Shinoa and absorbed the third Dominus piece himself. He had allowed Shinoa to absorb the other two for the sole purpose of learning how to do it properly, but he didn't possess whatever special quality Shinoa did that allowed her to safely contain the glyphs. He immediately felt Dracula's dark power taking over him as he fought to resist his evil influence. Before he could hurt Shinoa unintentionally, he left, and Shinoa rushed back to Barlow to let him know what happened. Barlow stressed that Albus was too far gone he was a threat to the world. Shinoa would now have to do the unthinkable and slay him. Barlow knew that Albus was a threat to his ultimate plan and sent Shinoa on her mission. He was hiding out in a mysterious manner just beyond a graveyard, but Shinoa had to finish rescuing the remaining villagers that he had taken. She found Anna, Serge's sister, and Irina, the mother of the children. The family was finally reunited and they were taken back to Weigel Village safely. With all the villagers back in their homes, there were no distractions left. Shinoa had to stop Albus and retake Dominus. When she found him, he was almost a completely different person, taken over. But parts of Albus's original personality were still fighting for control. He begged Shinoa to run, but Dracula's power was far too great, and the Count's voice began coming through Albus, declaring that the slaughter of humanity would soon begin. Albus lost his life in the battle, and Shinoa absorbed the final piece of Dominus, Dracula's agony. But something miraculous happened. She began experiencing some of her lost memories, and some of Albus's, and his spirit appeared to her. She heard his voice from within, and Albus revealed it all. It wasn't him that stole her memories, it was her exposure to Dominus. Albus was simply trying to protect her from its power. He stole Dominus in order to study it, and in his studies he determined that Belmont blood might hold the key to stopping it. The villagers in Weigel Village held secrets many of them weren't even aware of. They were all descended from the Belmont clan, and had a close relation to Leon Belmont's bloodline. Albus studied their blood carefully to search for answers, and found none. But when Shinoa absorbed the glyphs imprisoning the Belmonts, some of the Belmont power was absorbed within her, allowing allowing her quick growth and strength, and allowing Albus's spirit to live within her. The Holy Belmont bloodline was powerful indeed. Before vanishing, Albus made Shinoa promise not to use Dominus, and she only wished she could feel some emotion. Albus seemed to sincerely care about her, but she couldn't feel anything from her past. With the complete Dominus within, Shinoa rushed to confront Barlow and demanded answers. Barlow attempted to convince her to use Dominus on a seal placed within Ecclesia, the seal that once broken would bring Dracula back to the world of the living. But Shinoa remembered her promised Albus and refused to use it. When Shinoa spoke the truth that Albus revealed, Barlow became enraged. He thought Shinoa would be the one strong enough to use Dominus, but she had failed him. He no longer needed her, and now he would become the vessel to resurrect Dracula. Thank <laughs> you. 
Shinoa's strength had grown much larger than Barlow had anticipated, and his plans were quickly unraveling. Shinoa refused to use Dominus as he had planned, and she was too powerful for him to steal it from her. The once good man known as Barlow was gone. He had been completely driven insane by Dracula, and his only solution to resurrect his master was to sacrifice himself and undo the seal. seal undone, Dracula's castle had returned, and Shinoa raced there to face her destiny. No Belmont could wield the vampire killer, Alucard was nowhere to be found, and Shinoa was groomed from childhood to become the ultimate weapon against him. She was humanity's only hope. The castle was filled with many inaccessible areas, areas blocked by walls she couldn't cross, but one monster in Dracula's castle had the power to pass through solid objects, one of Dracula's librarians, the Wall Man. <laughs> Shinoa gained the ability to pass through walls and inched her way closer and closer to Dracula, I fighting her way relentlessly shit. through his creatures. <laughs> After defeating the Shadow Wizard Blackmore in the Underground Labyrinth and the enormous Elagor Demon in the Castle's Arms Depot, Shinoa discovered a portion of the Kustos Glyph, three pieces that represented the three heads of Cerberus, the Guardian Dog of Hell. The pathway to Dracula's throne room was blocked by dark magic that only the three Cerberus Glyphs could unlock. The second glyph was found unprotected within the castle, a result of Shinoa storming it as soon as it resurrected. But the final glyph was in the possession of Dracula's right-hand monster, Death. After defeating Death, she collected the final glyph and used the combined power of the three to dispel the magic protecting the final area of the castle. <laughs> Castlevania's reconstruction wasn't yet completed, so the bridge leading to his throne room was out, and Shinoa had to find another way to cross it. The limitations of a normal human would have prevented them from finding a solution, but with Shinoa's magic absorbing powers, she was able to absorb a glyph that allowed her to fly with two magical wings. And with this ability, she was able to step foot into Dracula's lair. His plans to separate the Belmonts from their greatest weapon was successful, and the enemy standing before him was no threat in his eyes. Simply a young girl with basic knowledge on magic. I'm 
Dracula was a much more powerful foe than Shinoa anticipated. He was toying with her, and it was as if he couldn't even feel her attacks. If the Belmonts and the Vampire Killer had been needed in the past, what hope did she have to overcome his immense power? All she could do was use Dominus, but she had promised Albus she would never use it. Its use would take her life, but it was her only choice left, and she unleashed a blast of dark energy created from his anger, hatred, and agony. power of Dominus disintegrated Dracula, and Shinoa collapsed from exhaustion, the price to pay for using it. But this wouldn't be her end. Albus's spirit appeared once again. Before Dominus vanished, it demanded a soul be traded, and Albus stepped in to save her life. As a final wish before sacrificing himself, Albus wished to see Shinoa smile for the final time. Castle collapsed, Clesia was undone without leadership, and the stories of Dracula's battle with Shinoa disappeared into history. She was the first non-Belmont besides his own son to defeat him, and Shinoa chose to live her life avoiding any glory or the responsibility of carrying such weight on her shoulders. She was now free to choose her own path in life, the ultimate gift that her adoptive brother left her. But her victory would be short-lived. Without the power of the vampire killer to hold him back longer, Dracula's resurrections would become more frequent, and he could continue returning with ease. Someone would always need to be present to fight for humanity and keep him at bay. Five years later, in the year 1820, Dracula's followers resurrected him and a veteran vampire hunter known as Morris Baldwin sought to challenge the Count, but he couldn't do it alone. He traveled the land and discovered Weigel Village, the village of the Belmont descendants. Unfortunately, none of these Belmonts were trained as vampire hunters, but the secrets of Weigel Village would be revealed. In its past, it was the home of Desmond Belmont, a village where Simon was born. After Dracula's forces raised it to the ground, the Belmont extended family rebuilt it over the same ruins. During the attack, the Belmont training whip, Trevor's hunter whip, was also lost, but it was found and kept many years ago. The whip didn't have the power of the vampire killer, but it was a weapon consecrated to fight evil and in the right hands could combat the forces of darkness and seal away powerful vampires. The villagers gave Morris Baldwin the hunter whip and their blessings, and he traveled to face Dracula with his close friends and fellow vampire hunters, the Graves. The Graves family was given the hunter whip due to their connection to the Belmonts. While they weren't Belmonts in blood, they were descended from the Tatoyan family that aided Christopher Belmont in the past. Together, the Graves' husband and wife and Morris battled Dracula. The power of all three of them combined was enough to stop him, but barely. The Count was merely sealed away in the Chaos Realm, and Morris's friends, the Graves, lost their lives in the battle. Morris promised to watch over their son Nathan before they died, and he took him in as one of his own children. Nathan Graves grew up alongside Morris's own son Hugh, and both boys became skilled hunters, but Nathan was exceptionally skilled, and was awarded with the hunter whip when he came of age, something that would always cause tension between Nathan and Hugh. Morris was preparing the boys to one day face Dracula, knowing that the seal he placed would not hold forever. Dracula's once traitorous ally and now loyal follower, Carmilla, had returned. She had survived her last encounter against Richter and escaped with her life, retaking a new physical form. She organized Dracula's followers and brought them to her own castle in Austria, where she planned to release the seal containing
containing Dracula. This leads us to the year 1830 and the events of Castlevania's Circle of the Moon. Morris had been keeping tabs on Carmilla and her activity, and he knew she was attempting to resurrect the Dark Lord. He rushed to the castle with the boys, but he was too late to stop her. Dracula had returned. This time, he wouldn't let three vampire hunters overcome him in battle, and he destroyed the floor under Nathan and Hugh's feet, leaving Morris to face him alone. told Nathan that it was his duty to find his father and save him before it was too late, and went on his own to explore Carmilla's castle. Nathan wanted to find him just as badly, and set off with the hunter whip. With Dracula revived, his monsters followed him. Throughout his journey, Nathan began unlocking the inner power of the Hunter Whip. Similar to the Vampire Killer, it could absorb different elemental properties and shift its form, making it a formidable weapon in the right hands. While exploring his way back to the room where Dracula resurrected, Nathan encountered the demonic wizard, the Necromancer. It revealed that Morris was still alive, but a ritual was being prepared to drain him of his life force, and transfer it to Dracula in order to regain his full strength, one life for another. But they were waiting for the full moon, the catalyst that would begin the ritual, and Nathan had to rescue to his master before it was too late. Nathan was relieved to find Hugh safe, but Hugh reacted with anger. He wanted the glory of rescuing his father and defeating Dracula, and told Nathan to leave. Dracula fed from negative emotions, and he could sense Hugh's need for glory. Emotions that he could slowly take advantage of, and Nathan chased Hugh. His ambitions were a danger to himself, and it was one of the reasons that Morris decided to choose Nathan to wield the hunter whip over his own son. Nathan tracked Hugh down to a huge chamber and saw him being flung violently. There was a dangerous demon inside, and Hugh was no match for it. It was a trophy he wanted to claim victory over, but he was wounded from the fight, and Nathan was forced to enter alone against the Adramalek, a demon said to rule over a portion of hell. was angry that Nathan defeated it instead of him. He believed it was the power of the Hunter Whip that destroyed the monster, not Nathan's own abilities. Nathan never once defeated Hugh in training exercises, and Hugh argued that he was only chosen because his parents died fighting alongside his father. The young man was becoming more aggressive, and Nathan knew that he was behaving erratically and out of character. Dracula was already beginning to cast his influence over the young man, but they had to face many more obstacles before rescuing Morris. <laughs>
One of the most dangerous enemies in Nathan's path was Carmilla. He was getting too close and decided to confront him herself, while Dracula continued preparing the ritual. She taunted the young Nathan with his friend Hugh, stating that Dracula was taking over his mind easily, and it was only a matter of time before he were lost as well. <laughs> Carmilla was vanquished and suffered her final defeat, leaving her castle completely to Dracula. Throughout the night, Nathan had discovered multiple relics that allowed him to reach inaccessible areas of the castle, relics that gave him inhuman strength to crash through walls, the ability to jump impossible heights, and more. And as usual, when Dracula returned, death would return alongside him. After sending Death back to the Abyss, Nathan found Hugh again, but this time his friend had a look of evil in his eyes and yelled about being the superior one. Nathan knew he was being controlled by Dracula and he needed to save him somehow without killing him. The fight dragged on and Nathan forced Hugh to exhaust himself until he snapped from Dracula's control. Hugh understood now why Nathan was chosen as Morris's successor. He was too proud, he was too brash, and he felt incredible regret for attacking Nathan. He asked him for forgiveness and entrusted him with his father's safe return. In the room next to Hugh, Nathan found the key that would open the chamber to where the ritual was taking place, and he made his way back to where they originally entered the castle. Nathan entered the ceremonial chambers and found Dracula watching over Morris. The full moon was about to cast its light over for them and Morris's life force would be drained. But Nathan had made it just before it began, and Dracula enjoyed the fact that he could so easily peer into Hugh's desires and take advantage of him, and Nathan was furious that the vampire would toy with his friend's soul. It was time to seal Dracula away. Dracula was wounded, but not yet defeated. In a final attempt to destroy Nathan, he opened a portal to the Chaos Realm where he would draw the remainder of his power, and Hugh rushed in to save his father. He took Morris away from the castle and told Nathan to go through and make Dracula pay. Nathan jumped into the portal while Dracula was siphoning power and witnessed his grotesque new form. Thank <laughs> you. 
the Hunter Whip weakened Dracula and kept him at bay. The portal to the Chaos Realm was collapsing, and the two jumped back into the physical world, but Nathan had won the battle. Dracula was left powerless, and he promised to return, stronger than ever. Nathan promised that somebody would be waiting for him. Without the ritual to regain his full power, he faded away, and Carmilla's castle crumbled. boys stood alongside their master, and Morris congratulated Nathan. His power had surpassed his own, and he mastered the Hunter Whip. Hugh promised to train harder and improve himself, and there was peace for a time, but Dracula was seeking the ability to break through reality again, waiting on the other side for his followers to gather enough dark energy to allow his re-entry. In the year 1844, Dracula had regained enough power to send death into the living world and resurrect his castle, but to break him free from his entrapment by Nathan, they chose to perform a sacrifice, capturing a young virgin girl. Before beginning the ritual, Death recruited the help of the worst humanity had to offer, the French vampire Gilles de Rye. In his human life, a man accused of being a serial killer that targeted children and executed in the 1400s. As a vampire, a loyal servant of Dracula. And he also recruited the help of a witch named Dactrice. She was obsessed with gaining immortality and believed Dracula could help her achieve her goals. To show her loyalty to him, she killed 100 human children, including her own, and was granted knowledge of dark magic by Dracula. With his most evil generals together, Death sacrificed the virgin girl, and Dracula returned from his prison. true power remained behind in the Chaos Realm. In order to regain his full strength, he needed a vast source of dark energy, and a man named Cornell would be the answer. In ancient times, a curse was placed on a tribe of warriors. The curse turned the tribe into man-beasts, a fusion of wolf and man. The man-beasts had incredible power, but preferred to live peacefully with humans. Over time, the tribe decided to seal away the dark energy powering their transformations, but they could never lift the curse completely. In the year 1821, Cornell was born into the tribe, and grew up alongside his best friend Ortega. In their younger years, the boys competed against each other, and Cornell was always proven to be the better warrior. On one dark evening, the tribe lost control of their curse. They were overtaken by the savage nature of the man-beast, and attacked a nearby human village. Every innocent villager was believed to be slaughtered in the attack, and when he regained control of himself, Cornell saw the horror he helped create. He discovered that one young girl named Ada survived, and feeling incredible guilt, Cornell put her under his protection. He would redeem himself by taking care of her for the rest of his days, and he constructed a magical pendant that would protect her from the others. Ada was too young to remember the truth behind what happened, and Cornell adopted her as his own sister. He swore that he would never harm an innocent with his power again, and set out to train himself to control the man-beast inside. After much focus and self-reflection, Cornell did gain mastery over his form, and became the only man-beast with the ability to change at will without losing himself. His tribe was impressed with his accomplishments and bestowed him with the name Blue Crescent Moon. His dark power soon attracted Death, and Death asked him to use that dark power to serve Dracula. Cornell refused, and Death could feel that he was the source of power needed to regain Dracula's strength. Without Cornell's cooperation, Death had to concoct a scheme to lure him to the castle. Ortega had become jealous of the tribe's recognition of Cornell, and Death secretly promised him that Dracula could unleash his inner power if he promised to serve. Ortega agreed and helped them form a plan to take Cornell's ability. One day, Cornell left on a training mission and left Ada in his village's care while he was gone. He left to search for a cure for the rest of his people so the curse of the man-beast could finally come to an end, and Ortega enacted Death's plan, leading us to the year 1844 and the events of Castlevania Legacy of Darkness. When Cornell returned home to the man-beast village after failing to find a cure, 
and found it on fire. Ortega had attacked his own people with an army of Dracula's minions and burned the village to the ground. Any survivors were taken and placed under Dracula's full control. Cornell desperately looked for Ada, but could only find the pendant he gave her. She was now in Dracula's grasp, a tool to lure Cornell to the castle. Ada! Dracula's resurrected castle was placed across a foggy lake, and Cornell took a damaged boat to cross it. Dracula wanted Cornell to reach the castle, but ordered his monsters to attack in order to keep up the charade. After destroying the sea monster, Cornell made it inside Dracula's castle and ran into Ortega. He was shocked to see another survivor from his village and was happy that his friend was alive and well. But happiness quickly turned into shock when Ortega revealed that he had orchestrated the attack on their own people. Dracula had given Ortega the power he promised, and Ada was in the Dark Lord's possession. Ortega was eager to test his abilities, but Cornell needed to come to the castle before he could face him. Cornell made his way deeper inside and discovered that Dracula's castle had appeared right by the grounds of a family home, the Oldry family. They were simply innocent bystanders stuck within the grounds of Castlevania, and the family was used as entertainment for the vampire Gilderai. The head of the family, Master Aldry, was turned into a vampire, and his wife Mary locked herself in a room, trying to hide from his thirst for blood. Cornell walked in on him, attempting to coax her out, and Master Aldry revealed himself as a vampire. Cornell had rescued Mary, and she explained that her husband had constantly been going after her and their son Henry. He was just a little boy, and after his father attempted to kill him, he ran away. Mary was worried that he was lost outside in the manor's hedge maze, and asked Cornell to please rescue him and take him away from this horrible place. Cornell had a soft spot for children after spending time raising Ada, and agreed to look outside for Henry. The hedge maze was a labyrinth, and a young boy could easily become lost within its twists and turns. From a distance, Cornell could smell the scent of a child, and found Henry running away from Dracula's gardener.
Cornell rescued Henry and led him to the garden's exit. Before leaving, he gave him the pendant and told him to run into the forest. As long as he had the pendant, the wolves in the forest would protect him and watch over him until Cornell could save Ada. Henry was worried about his mother and was forced to leave her behind. Cornell could smell the dark blood coursing in her veins. He could sense that she had already been bitten and her fate was already sealed. But Henry still had a chance at a full life. Cornell followed the maze into an underground area where he encountered Dracula's minions. They were astounded with Cornell's power and understood why Dracula wanted to take it for himself. They escaped to fight another day and left a trail for Cornell to follow into the secret underground area leading to the outer wall of Dracula's castle, lined with death traps, deadly falls, and a harpy. Dracula's new castle was surrounded by multiple towers, each themed with various aspects of Dracula's interests. The art tower held some of his most precious possessions, and contained multiple locked doors powered by the rays of the sun or the light of the moon. The Tower of Ruins held treasures from the ancient world and breakable floors that could lead weary travelers into certain death, with passages that would lead to nowhere. But Cornell's enhanced senses allowed him to follow Ada's scent out of the Tower of Ruins easily and into the Tower of Science. In his human life, Dracula, once Matthias, was quite intelligent and enjoyed studying alchemy and the sciences. Even as a vampire, he never abandoned the quest for knowledge and developed technology centuries ahead of its time. If Lisa hadn't been murdered, he surely would have changed the world and advanced the human race into a new age. But fate was cruel, and all of his sciences and developed technology was used for his own evil purposes. After escaping the Tower of Science, Cornell found himself inside the Duel Tower, a tower Dracula used to test the strength of his own monsters in an obstacle course designed to create the best soldiers to lead his armies. At the end of the Duel Tower, Cornell was forced to face one of his fellow villagers and realize the horror that they had been put through. Dracula took the Man Beast and undid the seals containing much of their power, forcing them to lose control completely to the Beast and suffer a painful transformation into twisted versions of their previous selves. Ortega left Cornell to be tested and awaited his arrival.
After completing the dual tower, the Tower of Execution was filled with Dracula's fiery rage and was dedicated to the worship of instruments of torture and death. Guillotines, spikes, every manner of horrific devices was found here, and the Tower of Sorcery was dedicated to Dracula's passion for magical abilities. Although many humans had used magic for the good of humanity, such as the Speakers, Dracula corrupted everything he touched with his own version of dark sorcery. And finally, Cornell reached the outside and confronted Ortega for the final time. Ortega was adamant this would not be a repeat of their youth. This time he would be the victor and deliver the defeated Cornell to Dracula. Dracula had betrayed him. Instead of simply unlocking his man-wolf powers, he bestowed Ortega with such powerful dark energy that the young man simply couldn't control it. With such an influx of dark magic, Cornell was still able to defeat Ortega, and Ortega finally conceded that Cornell was simply a better warrior. He felt regret to what he did to his own people, and felt the power overloading his body. It was too late for him to undo the mistakes he had made, but he could at least hope that Cornell could rescue Ada, and sacrificed himself to protect his friend. After the confrontation with Ortega, Cornell traversed the clock tower and found Ada on the ground, unconscious, and by herself. But it was a trap set by Death to further taunt him into following her trail. Death was frustrated that Ortega had failed to deliver Cornell and took Ada with him to Dracula's chambers. Cornell took the bait and hurried through the clock tower, and following the long steps to Dracula's throne room like so many before him had done before. Dracula stood before Cornell and demanded that he use his full power against him if he wanted to save Ada. If Dracula wanted him to strike, he would do so, if it was the only way to save Ada from his grasp. Cornell proved powerful enough to give Dracula a challenge, but refused to give in to Dracula's demands and unleash the man-wolf. In response, Dracula began absorbing Ada and used her life force to reveal one of his ultimate forms. The level of Dracula's power was now too great for Cornell to handle, and he had to transform in order to rescue her.
Dracula seemed to be defeated, but this was his plan from the beginning. He used Ada as a pawn to push Cornell into releasing his man-wolf powers into Dracula's grasp. Cornell gave up his man-wolf abilities and allowed Dracula to have them as the vampire was sinking back into the abyss. But Dracula knew his defeat was necessary in order to be reborn, using the dark energy of the wolf. Cornell and Ada were both free from Dracula, and they left the castle together to create a new life. The village and their people were gone, but they still had each other. And at that moment, the young Henry appeared. Wolves had protected him and guided him back to Cornell, and the three of them left together. While back in the castle, Death was using the man-wolf power extracted from Cornell to fuel Dracula's true return to power, the means to attain a new body. The ritual was a success, and in a village not too far from the castle, a child was born. A boy named Malice, in reality Dracula returning in physical form. His spirit dwelled within the body, and on his eighth birthday, Malice awakened as Dracula. He murdered his parents and burned down his entire village. For a time before that, Death and Dracula's followers were kidnapping children and bringing them to the castle, unsure of which ones would ultimately become Dracula. Death discovered Malice and took him to the castle after he realized that he was actually Dracula. Stories of the missing children were spreading, as well as rumors of Dracula's return, and this would be an opportunity for multiple heroes to arise and the Belmont clan to regain some of their former glory. In the year 1827, a child was born to the Richter Belmont, Michael Gelhart. Belmont. Michael, being Richter's son, was trained as a hunter, but like the rest of his bloodline, he no longer had the vampire killer. He was ashamed of his family name and hated that his father temporarily becoming a dark lord was to blame for losing their greatest treasure. He wanted to separate himself from the family name, and when he married, he took his wife's surname of Schneider. In the year 1827, his wife gave birth to Richter's grandson. They named him Reinhard Schneider. Reinhard grew up knowing the stories of the Belmont clan and was teased by the other kids in his village. Nobody believed he was related to the glorious Belmont clan due to his last name. He swore that one day he would prove his worth and stand aside his ancestors of legend. Reinhardt was trained by his own father as a hunter and was taught to carve his own destiny forward. In the year 1840, a girl named Carrie Fernandez was born to a family of Spanish immigrants that were descended from the Belmont's bloodline. She was gifted with powerful magical abilities and some parts of society still feared users of magic. Most of her family was executed for witchcraft, but she escaped and was adopted by a kind, accepting woman. When Dracula's forces were searching for the reborn Dracula, her village was one of the ones attacked, and her adoptive mother was killed, protecting her. Her rage at seeing her foster mother's death activated her powerful magic, and she decimated Dracula's forces. From that day forth, Carrie swore that she would bring vengeance upon Dracula, and she left to find his castle. By the year 1852, Reinhardt had heard of the missing children and the stories of Dracula's return. He left his family's home and befriended Carrie during his travels. While searching for the means to destroy Dracula, Carrie and Reinhardt heard stories of a vampire hunter wielding a holy whip that had faced Dracula before and won, Nathan Graves. Now much older and a more experienced hunter, Nathan still carried the Belmont clan's hunter whip and agreed to hand it over to the family it once belonged to. Reinhard and Carrie traveled to meet him, and Nathan respectfully passed on the whip to its proper owner. The pair came upon the Forest of Silence just outside Castlevania and entered, leading us to the year 1852 and the events of Castlevania 64. Courage, don't leave me. Whatever awaits, 
I have no regrets. The two agreed to take different paths and meet up later to cover more ground. Reinhardt discovered dead villagers along the way and an army of skeletons, protecting the entrance to Dracula's castle. Carrie explored the forest outside and used her impressive abilities to destroy the monsters surrounding it. Once inside, Reinhardt traveled through the same hallways that Cornell traveled through. Since the castle never collapsed since the dark power from the man-wolf was holding it together, it still had a similar appearance to the original castle, complete with additional monsters protecting the keep. Reinhardt unleashed the hunter whip against them, and then seemingly met Dracula. This vampire was merely a decoy. Malice was roaming around the castle in his childlike form, watching Reinhardt and Carrie's actions, while Gilles de Rye posed as Dracula, as Dracula's body double. Reinhardt also found the Oldry mansion now abandoned by any human occupants. Nearby villagers had all been turned into vampires against their will. Inside the manor's rose garden, it had a new caretaker. Another girl turned into a vampire from a nearby village called Rosa. She tended to the garden's white roses with blood, turning them a dark red color. Oddly enough, she had no animosity towards Reinhardt and was rather pleasant. Reinhardt made it clear that he was there to destroy Dracula, but she had no love for the Count. She never asked to be an undead vampire, and she guided him. Reinhardt searched inside the manor's master bedroom and found another human that attacked him, Charlie Vincent, the self-proclaimed mightiest vampire hunter. The old man also came to the castle to destroy Dracula and dismissed Reinhardt as an unexperienced boy that had no place there and ordered him to leave immediately and leave Dracula to him. But Reinhardt was determined to prove himself by destroying Dracula. Inside, he also met a demon named Renan. Typically, demons were not to be trusted, but Renan was more businessman than demon. He simply provided goods for money, nothing more, and provided Reinhardt with his services. But Reinhardt refrained from using him too much, only when he was needed. Demons were known to turn against humans and have stipulations in their contracts that could be taken advantage of. He headed towards the outside of the manor. Finally outside, Reinhardt met the young boy Malice. Malice claimed he was one of the kidnapped children that were taken, and all he wanted was to go home and Reinhardt immediately jumped at the chance to protect him. Malice behaved like a scared child, but was secretly Dracula, hoping that Reinhardt would be so distracted with his safety that his monsters could kill him. <laughs>
Wallace's frustration, Reinhardt successfully fended off the monsters and saved him, leading him outside the labyrinth, and he made his way underground via a secret entrance. Carrie followed Reinhardt's trail to the manor and through the hedge maze and found a similar underground area where she was attacked by a villager that had just murdered a woman. Carrie used her power to destroy the vampire, but the woman was no victim. Henry's mother Mary was bitten before Cornell had arrived at the estate and had become a vampire and was no longer the woman that Henry remembered. Carrie never knew her, but she was the one that would finally give Mary peace. the underground levels of the castle, a huge waterway filled with poison liquid and lizard men guarded the sewers, but the lizard men were no match for her magic. Carrie successfully made it through and ran into the witch actrice. She didn't recognize her, but the evil witch knew the power the girl possessed. She must have had Belnada's blood in her. She offered her a partnership and promised that Dracula could make all her dreams come true if they could restore his strength, then vanished. Carrie made it inside the castle's center just before Reinhardt had left the underground tunnels that were home to monsters that appeared to be human and spider all at once. Just before the castle center, Reinhardt saw Rosa again, standing unusually still and staring at the sunlight. Just as he entered, Rosa stepped into the light and began burning. He rushed in to save her. Although she was a vampire, he felt no evil from her and couldn't stand by and watch as she killed herself. His act of kindness shocked her, and it was clear that she was in immense emotional pain. Rosa begged Reinhardt to slay her, but he refused to harm her, and she remarked that showing that level of mercy proved that he had no chance against Dracula. The castle center was an immense hub, protected by several of Dracula's creatures, and villagers that had been turned were everywhere, as well as monsters created from blood. Castle Center also contained an unbreakable wall that Reinhardt couldn't get through without setting off an explosive, and he traveled to the castle's alchemy lab, where he ran into Malice again. The boy questioned why Reinhardt was there, and taunted him. Dracula was enjoying playing the role of a child, and expressed his hatred for humanity, leaving Reinhardt confused and stunned. Who was this boy, and why was he behaving so unusually? But Reinhardt had to transport the explosive known as Magical Nitro, and combined it with Mandragora to explode the wall. It was also protected by a magical seal, and he worked to together with Carrie to undo it. Magic was her specialty, and she found the means to undo the seal protecting the cracked wall and the castle's observatory. Once the seal was released, the explosive was set off and Reinhardt encountered the behemoth.
After the battle, Reinhardt stood before Death and Rosa. He heard stories of Death growing up and was immediately ready to take him on, but Death was using Rosa as a weapon against him. Reinhardt had no desire to fight her, but she dreamed of Death. Existence as a creature of the night is nothing she ever wished for. <laughs> Reinhardt disarmed her, and Rosa collapsed on the floor. She asked Reinhardt to please tell her parents that even as a vampire, she never lost her human soul. Death took much enjoyment from her suffering, and swore that she would one day succumb to the vampire's curse and become a monster like them. Death took her away, and Reinhardt made his way through the duel tower that Cornell had battled through, and was forced to face the same gauntlet of trials. Carrie left the observatory and found Actrice. The witch was covered in dark power, and Carrie refused the offer that was previously made. She promised that Dracula would be destroyed. Reinhardt was already becoming a problem, and Actrice couldn't risk Carrie joining him against her master. But Actrice wouldn't fight Carrie just yet. She summoned her own warrior, another user of magic, also a Fernandez, and cousin to Carrie by blood. She had attempted to come to the castle and fight Dracula, but she was taken alive, tortured, and turned into a vampire. She struggled against the curse, but eventually it took hold, and she became a tool for the forces of darkness to use. Carrie was sad that she couldn't save her, but much like Mary, she was put at peace. While Reinhardt fought his way through the dual tower, Carrie went through the Tower of Science and the Tower of Sorcery, reaching closer and closer to Dracula. Reinhardt passed all the tests he was faced with and made it past the Tower of Execution, leading to the upper levels of the castle and death once again. Death was furious that he had made it so far and attacked him with his deadly sights. The young vampire hunter was in danger, but Rosa stepped in the way, taking the impact. Her life was draining rapidly, and her selfless act saved Reinhardt's life. He was a man of God and promised Rosa that she could attain redemption, even if she was cursed by Dracula. He was filled with rage against death and would prove his might as Belmont, even without the vampire killer. Reinhardt's true strength was his character and his unbreakable will. Count's plans were being destroyed slowly, and his most powerful servants were failing him. Just through the clock tower, he found the staircase leading to Dracula, and Renan blocked his path. The demon was simply concluding their contract as he was no longer needed, and left to find other clients. As the fight raged on, Carrie just outside was stopped by Actrice. The witch described what it was like gaining her immortal power, expressing no regret that she took the lives of her own children to attain it. And Carrie remembered her own adoptive mother, loving her unconditionally. A person that would take the lives of children, especially her own children, is a monster that had to be destroyed.
as Actrice was destroyed, Reinhardt annihilated Dracula, and the castle tower began collapsing. But Dracula was, in fact, very much alive. The vampire Reinhardt destroyed was no more than the decoy. Carrie would have joined Reinhardt for the final battle, but she believed he must have succeeded since she saw the tower collapsing from a distance, and she made her way outside. On his way down, Malice appeared to Reinhardt and surprised the hunter. The boy was pure evil, and it was becoming obvious he was more than he seemed. Malice announced his identity as Dracula and took a new, younger form, more agile and stronger than he had been in a long time. Reinhardt to fall to his knees immediately and accept Dracula as the new lord and master of the entire world. But Reinhardt had no plans to back down. As Carrie exited the castle, someone else was just arriving. The young boy Cornell saved, Henry, was now a grown man and a skilled knight. The church sent him to rescue the missing children after they heard the castle was being assaulted by Belmont. With Dracula's defeat imminent, he had to make it through the castle before it collapsed. Henry followed the trail left by the heroes and discovered the children one by one until they were all saved, and had to fight his way through his own share of monsters. But Cornell had prepared him well for a life of defending the innocent. Henry left the castle quickly with the rescued children before the final battle concluded. Reinhardt defeated Dracula, but the vampire was talented in the art of deception and reverted back into the guise of an innocent young boy. Reinhardt had never encountered vampires before this day and naively went to help the child. But Charlie Vincent could see right through the illusion and Dracula took his ultimate form.
Dracula's plan failed. He was defeated by a young woman using his own dark power, a young man without any blood connection to the Belmonts using an inferior whip, and now an actual Belmont with that very same whip. In a world without Belmonts, heroes were still rising to stand against him. Reinhardt watched the castle fall, and by some miraculous event, Rosa reappeared, given a second chance at life, and purified. Reinhardt proudly reclaimed his family name after proving himself, and took the identity of Schneider Belmont. And he left together with Rosa, the woman that he would one day start a family of his own with. Carrie left to visit her adoptive mother's grave and paid her respects. With her promise fulfilled, her anger against the world and Dracula subsided, and she was free from her pain. Henry was celebrated as a hero and traveled with the children, returning them one by one to their homes. Concluding the events, Castlevania 64. Join me next time for the Castlevania Timeline Chapter 7, The Heroic Morris Clan. In a time of worldwide chaos, the Earth is covered in a perpetual state of war, and human suffering drives the engines of Dracula's return. And Alucard fulfills his duty of finding heroes that can wield the might of the Vampire Killer, a new bloodline that will help the Belmonts undo the past. Since you made it to the end of this video, I assume you enjoyed it, so why don't you go ahead and smash that like button, subscribe, and ring the bell so you don't miss any new content. You can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, links in the description below. And if you'd like to support the channel, you can join my Patreon or become a channel member. This is Fabian, I love you guys, and I'll see you next time.